All right. Let's open up our let's open up our Bibles to Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Please open up your Bible, open up your Bibles to Psalm 121. Why don't we take turns and read this together, all right? Psalm 121. I'll read verse 1 in the ESV, in English Standard Version, and whatever the version you may have. Now let's take turns and read this, all right? Number, verse 1. Psalm 121, verse 1. A song of ascent. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? He will not let your foot be, be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we just come before you this morning. Uh, Father, I thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And even this morning, although the world has um, gone even further away from you, Father, I thank you that your kingdom has come near us. Father, um, as we come before you, I do ask that you would just cover us up with the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. And I do ask that you would um, just anoint us uh, with, uh, the oil, w- with the oil of the Holy Spirit. Lord, would you come and just faithfully speak to us as you have always spoken to us. We entrust all these things into your hands, in your faithful hands. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, this is our fourth fourth session um I don't, well it's time spent just flying by no are we, are we dreading over this <laughs> all right um it's been a pretty exciting ride for me too because uh it's, you know it's been i guess five years since i actually have been to atlanta last time i uh, filled up my gas tank here in Atlanta was gas was one one ninety two per gallon, but now it's three fifteen. It's been five years. Well, um, we've been talking about the five things. Um, how do we prepare ourselves for the nearing kingdom of God? Um, in order to really prepare ourselves, um, we need to remember the five things that. Uh, we've been talking about number one the glory what do i live for the, for the remaining time number two the journey when you try to live for the glory of god um god asks you ultimately when you behold his glory he says come and join me on this journey so once you start to join the journey that he's going um you'll begin to see um that he's taking you not in the, into the comfortable places, but he actually takes you to the, probably the most remote places. That's the journey that we examined yesterday morning, the journey. And when you go on that journey, uh, there are probably many questions that sh- that's going to come up in your mind. Uh, thinking, God, where are you taking me? How am I going to be able to finish this journey? And how's the world going to be? And those are the things that we talked about last night. The world, the Christians, and how we ought to live in this world as a Christian and keep our faith and run the race and what's waiting for me, what's stored up for me in the end. And that's the crown. And that's the calling that we examined yesterday. And uh, this morning, we're going to actually ask another question. Um, as a Christian, uh, as I live in, live in this world, when a lot of the changes are hap- happening very rapidly and the entire world is actually um, is, is about to um, turn upside down pretty soon. I'm not really excited about the year 2012 because a lot of things are waiting to happen for us. And when it does, um, we're going to be asking the question, how is this going to end? Am I going to be able to make it to the end? 
Um, am I going to be able to survive? Am I going to be able to keep my faith? Am I really going to be able to run the race? You know, there's many questions, not because we don't trust ourselves, but we don't trust, uh, we, don't, we, we ultimately don't trust God, God's faithfulness, keeping our faith on our behalf. So tonight, uh, t- this morning, we want to ask this, um, the question, how am, I going to be, how am I going to be able to survive? How am I going to withstand these last days? And that's why we're going to talk about the song, the song of trust. Um, psalm 121 is actually known, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a psalm that's known as the song of trust. And if you look at this um, series, um, Psalm 120 to 134 is actually known as um, a series of 15 psalms put together. And these, song, uh, these psalms are called the Song of the Saints. So if you look at uh, um, Psalm 121, the beginning uh, phrase, the beginning sentence, is, what, what does it say in the be- very, very beginning, whatever the version you may have, NIV, or what do you have? NIV. What does it say in the beginning? Song of Ascent. Um, Song of Ascent. Let me translate that into uh, maybe another Hebrew word that you might know: the Song of Alias. It means um, as you're walking towards the Jerusalem Temple, as you're walking towards the Holy Mountain, Mount Zion, as you're walking to- towards the Holy City, um, you're seeing this song. So when we talk about Song of Ascent, uh, Ascent we're, we're not only talking about as we're only going up to the Jerusalem Temple, we sing a song. As we go to church, we sing a song. I'm not talking about that. The Song of Ascent is actually a song, uh, or the songs that's specifically dedicated um, for the people that's making Aliyah into the Holy City. So if you stay, for, for those of you that, uh, that's been, that have actually visited uh, the Holy City, the, the Holy Land, um, if you actually stand in um, the Judean desert, if you, if you look at the holy city, it's not below the surface of the water, but it's actually, the city of Jerusalem is actually set above, um, above the, the sea level, which is like actually a pretty higher ground. I think it's um, a plus, I think it's above what, 600, 800, 800, 800 meters above the sea level. That's Jerusalem. It's actually set. It's a city set on the hill. And um, but not only that kind of geographical um, aspect that we're talking about, but I'm talking more specifically uh, about um, what happened in the past when the Babylonians came in and invaded Israel, and they were a lot of the a lot of the Jews were actually taken captive into the land into the land of Chaldeans, and as we as they were living as prisoners of war as they were living as the slaves uh, of the land. And they actually had this one dream, one hope, maybe a trust, saying maybe one day God's going to restore us to the holy land. One day God's going to restore us to the promised land once again. And one day we'll become a nation. One day God's going to reign over us again. One day that we will rise up again as the kingdom of God. And that is not supposed to be only their confessions. But I want that to be the confession that we make as we live in this last day and age. Many times we have this, um, I guess, uh, curiosity or or perhaps these questions in in our minds, thinking, am I going to be able to make it to the end? God, if you're really out there, am I going to really make it to the end? Because the world doesn't really look, uh, everything that's around me doesn't look really promising, but am I going to be able to make it to the end? God says, sing the song of trust. And that's what we're going to examine this morning. Three things. Number one, declaration of trust. Declaration of trust. Number two, um, the reasons for trusting. The reasons to trust. And number three, um, the content of help. So how is the Lord going to actually help us? So three things we're going to examine this morning. So let's jump in. Number one, the declaration of, help, of um, the, the declaration uh, of trust. You know, there are some days that I speak really fast, but there are days that, you know, I can't talk. Um, so I'm actually fighting this linguistic battle. There's a lot of languages going, going on in my head. Konnichiwa, I say hello. So I'm fighting this linguistic battle in my, in my heart, in my mind. So please fight it with me. 
let's look at verse one and two. The, song, uh, the, the declaration of trust. Verse one and two. Let me read this, all right? A song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From, the where, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This passage, Song of Trust especially, I know this is called Song of Ascents from Psalm 120 to 134. 15 Psalms is a one series about um, Israelites singing towards the Holy Land, thinking of the Holy Land, missing the Holy Land, thinking, you know what, God, one day I know you will restore us to the Holy Nation. One day I know you're going to restore us to the Promised Land. One day we'll go home. One day we're going to be able to go up to the temple of God and we're going to be able to worship you over there once again in our lifetime. It's a song of hope. But especially Psalm 121 is dedicated as the song of trust. I trust in you. I trust in you alone until that day comes. No matter my reality, no matter what my reality, reality may look like, I, I may be a slavery, I may be a prisoner right now, I may be living in this foreign land, but I know one day that you, I, I, know, I know for sure, one day you're going to restore me into that promised land where I belong. And this psalm, this psalm actually starts, it begins, it, it, commence, it commences with a declaration, a, a strong declaration of their trust towards the Lord. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come? Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you this morning that um, what, whatever that keeps our faith together, whatever makes us to run the race and finish the course, and whatever makes us to fight the good fight until the day that we actually keep our faith, it's not defined by what's around us. It's, not def- it's never defined by our circumstances. It's never defined by the answers to prayers. You know, whatever that can make you happy today can also make you unhappy tomorrow. So if your happiness is solely based on what can make you happy today, you have to understand that very thing can also make you very unhappy tomorrow. If your girlfriend makes you happy today, it can make you unhappy tomorrow. She can make you unhappy unless you're dating an iRobot or something. You know, I have that story too. I actually, um, I remember the time that God actually had to restructure my life because um, I actually had a girlfriend a long time ago, a long, long time ago. Um, I was, um, you know, born in Korea. I was raised in Korea until I was 10. And uh, at age 10, I moved to Japan where my father was born and raised. So my father is very Japanese, and especially he's too Japanese. Um, he's the Japanese Yakuza, you know, all that stuff. So he's really, really Japanese, old-fashioned man. So, you know, when I first arrived in Japan, my dad told me, you know, whatever you learned until now as a Korean, until age 10, forget about it. Now you've got, you got to restructure your life. I'm going to recreate you. I'm going to make, make you into a Japanese person so you can actually fit into the Japanese society. You've got, you got to learn the Japanese language. Unless you speak to me in the Japanese language, I'm not, going to, I'm, I'm not going to answer you. For me, that was actually pretty hurtful because he was telling me to pretty much forget about everything that I, I learned until I was age 10. But what am I supposed to do? In order to live with my father, I had to restructure my life. I had to, re- I had to recreate myself as a Japanese man. Well, after 10 years of um, living in Japan, I graduated. I went to the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, deep south, where a lot of racism is. I'll probably talk about that tonight. Um, when I went there, it's my first day, of sc- uh, first day of military school. I attended, you know, I, I, I went in. They sh- you know, shaved your hair off, like, you get into the uniform, and you're just standing there. All these upperclassmen come to you, and they yell at you, like, ah, what do I do, you know? They come to you, like for each freshman, there's about five upperclassmen, you know, just yelling at you in your face. And I still remember um, what one of the upperclassmen said to me that day. He said, I don't know where you came from. I don't know what kind of grades you graduated high school with. I don't care what you are, but we will break you down and we will make you into a person that we want you to be. You know what that sounded like? He's talking just like my father. <laughs> But what am I supposed to do? So I learned the military way, the U.S. military way, how to talk like a guy, how, how, to, how to eat like a man, how, how to function or how to act like a man, you know, how to 
laugh like I'm, <laughs> you know, you know. I, I, four years of military school will teach you that. You know, they, they even teach you how to take a shower like a man. He's like, man doesn't do soap their body. Never, never use pom poms, you know. <laughs> never do that. You know, I found that in, in my um, bathtub. Somebody actually placed that in my bathroom. So I actually used that for the first time. I was like, hmm, it feels good, you know. Never use that. In military school, they teach you, you know, just one shampoo, okay. You just, just everything, you just put a towel around you, you go to your room. Four years of training to be a beast. And as soon as I graduated, I went to seminary, a Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is a very conservative seminary uh, of um, EV Free Church, Evangelical Free Church. It's a very conservative seminary. Actually, in fact, um, about until a year before I entered Trinity, it was mandatory for all seminarians were to dress up and wear a tie when they go to class. So that is very conservative. And uh, by the time I entered, they didn't have that with those rules, but it was still a very conservative setting. So when I walked in with my completely shaved head, and uh, I was wearing a red Marine Corps T-shirt, I walked in in my Jeep, and uh, guess what's going to happen, you know? First day, I was living in the dorm. I walked into the bathroom. I took a shower, one shampoo, okay. I washed up and I put a towel around me. I was holding my you know, shampoo bottle. I was walking into my room. All the seminarians, all the young pastors, they were like, ah! They, were, they ran over to their rooms. I was thinking, what's going on here? Later, I hear a rumor. People are talking about me. You know, the seminarians, they actually talk about you behind your back. They actually said, you know, he's a beast. Then I actually had a question, you know, who am I? Where do I belong? Where do I fit in? Am I Korean? Am I Japanese? Am I American? Am I military? Or am I Christian? Or am I pastor? Am I what? And then I was struggling, and I thought my girlfriend, you know, would always be with me. You know, she used to make me really happy at that time. As soon as I entered seminary, since I've been waiting to you know, meet someone in the seminary, it's like as soon as I walked into seminary, oh, God, I want to get married. I want to be a pastor. It's, it's almost like married, pastor. Pastor, you have to get married. Wrong perception, you know. So I was like, I, I got to get married because I want to be a pastor, you know. So as soon as I entered, I was thinking, oh, godly woman, godly woman. I, wanna, I need to find a woman. So... I actually met someone, a great girl, but we were actually, um, you know, dating each other. So it was probably about five months into the relationship. I was thinking, okay, I want to. She, she makes me happy, no matter, you know, whether I'm confused or not about my identity, whether I'm actually happy about myself or not. She makes me happy. I thought she was going to stay with me forever. But guess what? One day, she called me. She calls me. I was like, hello? And she goes, we need to talk. So I was like, okay. You know, guys, guys, when a girlfriend calls you and ever tells you, we need to talk, don't go out. <laughs> Nothing good comes out. I was pretty innocent, right? Because I was pretty innocent. So I said, oh, what's going on here? And she, guess what she said? She goes, you have no idea who you are. Goodbye. And she left. You know, I thought that was bad. So I walked into my room. I felt like my life was crumbling down into pieces. I thought everything that I believed in, everything that I was, the very source that I was drawing my happiness from, the very source that I was drawing out my, uh, I guess, comfort from, that evaporated in a single moment. And I didn't have anyone to cling on to. I was just sitting in my room and then, about a week later, my friend knocked. Knock, knock. I opened the door, and my friend, a good friend of mine, he embraced me. And I was like, for one week, you know, I, like for, you know, I was just like, all my anger and all my sadness and everything was kind of building up, right? And um, when my friend embraced me, I, I broke into tears. I was just crying and crying. And my friend was saying, you know, it's okay, it's okay. I'm sorry, I should have come earlier. I, I should have come sooner. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you. I thought my friend could be trusted. And this is what he says. It's okay, it's okay. My friend goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I have a request to make. That's why I came. I was like, okay, what is it? And guess what he says? Even till now, I can't forget. This is what he says. You see, um, can I ask your ex-girlfriend out? Ooh, 
Ooh, you don't go there, right? 2011, May 1st, that was it. And, uh, you know, I, just looking at it from my small experience, I can tell you, I can guarantee you, looking at everything in my life, looking at the world, whatever that can make you happy, whatever that can make you, uh, whatever that can comfort you, can also make you unhappy and discomfort you tomorrow. So I'm going to ask you today, um, the surroundings don't, don't really define who you are. Whatever you have, really don't, don't, do not define who you are. What really enables you to withstand the last days and every circumstance that may come in your way is not what you have, it's not what you're surrounded by, but what you confess. Pretty much your faith is pretty much determined, the fate of your faith is determined by your confessions. What is a confession? It's the, I'm not talking about just the uttering words. I'm talking about what you really, really believe from inside. What do you believe? What did you confess this morning? Let's, let me tell you, let, let's take for instance, I wake up in the morning, and one of the first things that I confess is this. Lord, I have become one with you today. Therefore, from now until in, into eternity, I am your worshiper. That's the first thing that I confess this morning. As soon as I open my eyes, every morning I confess, I have become one with Christ. Now I am a worshiper from now until eternity. You know what that means? You know what that entails? In that little confession, everything's included. You know what that means? My worship doesn't begin when I enter this room. My worship has already begun the moment I open my eyes. And I live not as someone who does worship, but I live so, as someone who is a worshiper. Whether I eat or whether I drink or whether, whether I go to school or whether I engage com in conversations with other, other people, I am a worshiper. I do in fear of God. You know, what, whatever you confess really defines who you are. What is your confession before God? Are you one with Christ? We talk about, oh, I want to be one with Christ, but are you really one with Christ? When you're really one with Christ, you know, you know what Jesus feels inside? It's great that we have the spotlights and we are worshiping God. That's one side of God. But the other side says, do you remember the brothers and sisters who cannot worship in, this, in such a setting? Who's right now hiding under persecuted churches? Do you remember that in your worship? If you're really one with Christ, why don't you remember those things? What's the country that's well, located you know what right next to China? Between China and South Korea, what's located there? North Korea. You know how North Koreans worship on, uh, for, for, worship, uh, for, on Easter's, Easter Sundays? You know, Christmas, December 25th, every year it doesn't change. Easter, Easter Sunday it changes every year. And North Koreans worship like this. They talk with other brothers and sisters in Christ. They say, I hear that last week was the Easter Sunday. And this guy goes, oh my goodness, was it? And yeah, he goes, yeah, I heard, from my, I heard from my source that people in Korea, in South Korea, they celebrated Easter Sunday last week. And they're like, okay, we got to do this week. And they, they eat together. They don't have eggs. They don't have anything. They sit down. They keep their eyes open. As they're just talking with each other, they're worshiping the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the resurrection. And one guy goes, yeah, let's, we got to keep the voice down. God, thank you so much for the resurrection. Thanksgiving, for example, we concentrate so much on how to make God so happy. But you know where God's, God's heart really is? Brothers and sisters who are hungry right now. So if you really say you're one with Christ, how could you just concentrate on celebrating and being fancy and making it better when you are not remembering the brothers and sisters who cannot enjoy that kind of luxury? And would you be still able to say, you know, I'm one with Christ? You're not really. If you don't remember the entire picture, you're not one with Christ. You know partially about God. Well, let, me give you an, let, me, let me give you another example. Do you think North Korea is open for missions or closed for missions? What do you think? I'm not, it's, this, this is not a rhetorical question, so yeah, you can answer. Is, is North Korea open or closed? Why? 
Because in that aspect, we're not one with Christ. Why? Does, Christ, does, does Jesus Christ reign over North Korea right now or not? How far does Christ's reign go? Above the heavens, above the earth, and under the earth, does he reign today? Or is, will he reign in the future only? Is Jesus reigning today? Yeah. What is that? Only people that says yeah like this is, are Indians. Yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> Don't do that. You're Korean. Yeah. <laughs> like, I go to India. That bothers me. It's like, sir, can I put my stuff here? Yes, sir. He's <laughs> like, yes or no? <laughs> Never do that. You're Koreans. Does Christ reign? the earth, the entire universe today, or he, will he only reign in the future? He reigns, he reigns now. The kingdom, have, the kingdom of God has come. And does Jesus Christ reign North Korea or not? Yes. Is Jesus Christ reigning the entire human history or not? And is he caring about the North Korean people or not? Yeah. But how come we say North Korea is closed when Jesus Christ already cares for it, he reigns over it, and he's making sure that the gospel reaches North Korea? Because we're not one with Christ. We don't, we don't, we don't get to act, we don't get to enjoy, uh, we don't get to enjoy the, the open universe with Christ. Is North Korea open or closed? Why do you think it's closed? Because you don't think, you, you say it, that God, you reign over the earth, but you really don't believe that. If you really believe that Jesus Christ reigns and he's one with me today, your authority goes beyond the heavens, above the earth, and under the earth. There's no obstacles in your life. It's just that you, you just have to let yourself go. Everything that you, have to know, you think you know, those things have to go. When you're one with Christ, nothing else matters. As long as Christ in you reigns over the earth and you're one with him, you can overcome any kind of obstacles that, come, that may come in your way. So your confession... If it only includes blessings and salvation and happiness and comfort, and if, if, you, if your confession only con contains that, but if it doesn't contain the persecution and the hardships and sufferings, that the sacrifice, those things may come in your way because of the faith that you confess. If those things are not included, and if your faith is only biased, your surroundings don't matter anymore. Your faith is doomed. It is pretty much doomed from the moment that you confess that faith. But today, if you, confess, if you have such confession, if you, such, if you have such a framework of your faith that says, you know what? I believe the blessings that come through Jesus. I believe the salvation. I believe everything, all the good things that come, in, you know, come through Jesus. But at the same time, I, I am willing to accept any kind of sufferings, persecution, or anything that, you know, that has to do with hardships. Because of the faith that I believe, I'm willing to accept both sides. You're going to be able to survive in this last day and age with that kind of faith. And this psalm actually begins with that kind of declaration. I lift up my eyes. I look at the hills. Where does my help come from? You know what that means? Two things. Number one, please repeat after me. I will not be influenced by my surroundings. I lift up my eyes and I look at the hills. Where does my help come from? The hill that it's talking about here, we're not talking about any mountains in Israel. And Psalm 120 to, uh, 120 to 134, like I said, it's a song of ascent. And they're talking about one Pacific hill. You know what that is? It's Mount Zion. Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. That's where the Ark, that's a, that Ark of Covenant was placed. So when Israelites, though they were in Babylon, though they were living as prisoners of war, when they lift, up, uh, they lift up their eyes and they look at the hills, that means, God, I remember the promise. And because of the promise that I remember, I am not going to be affected by the surroundings or the circumstances, but I'm going to be impacted by your promise. Are you, do you choose to be overwhelmed by the surroundings or, or will you choose with me to be overwhelmed with the promise of God. If you're impacted by the promise of God, you will not be influenced by the surroundings. 
But if you let your surrounding bother you, you will no longer be influenced by the covenant of God. So I lift up my eyes, I look at the hills, means I will not be influenced by my, by my surroundings. But it also means the second thing. No, please repeat after me. Number, number two. Ready? I will be still and look upon the Lord. I'm going to be still and no matter what my surroundings may be, no matter what my circumstances may be, no matter how problem may, may seem, I'm going to be still. I'm going to wait upon the Lord and see what He's going to do in my life. And that's the faith that we ought to have in this last day and age. Because in this last day and age, brother, brothers and sisters, I'll probably talk about this more tonight. A lot of things just don't make sense anymore. It's theology, sometimes it just doesn't connect anymore. Sometimes our logic is already biased. We can't think straight. So one thing that does matter in this last day and age is covenant. When you try to, you know, obey God, when you trust, try to, you know, love God and you only like, you're thankful towards God for in, in, your, in your good times only, it's not a, it's not a covenant. It's, it's more like an agreement. But when the times get difficult, when the pressure goes up, and if you are still tr- choosing to be influenced by God, if you're choosing to still obey God, what is that? That, that becomes a covenant there. Covenant is not influenced by the surroundings or the changes that come in your way. Covenant goes beyond that. It's from now into eternity. So that's what it means, declaration of trust. Number two, I just want you to see, uh, I, want, I, I, want you, I want you to see with me, um, why can you trust God? Why, why, why can you trust Him? So the reasons for trust, let's read verses 3, uh, to, uh, three and 4. Let's read this together. Uh, Hold on. Actually, you know what? Let's, let's stay with verse 1 and 2. Let, but let me read this again, okay? Let me read verse 1 and 2 one more time. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and, earth, heavens and the earth. So in this two verses, there are three reasons why you can trust the Lord. Three reasons why you can trust the Lord. So you, you, you declare... I will trust the Lord no matter what, no matter what the surroundings, no matter what the circumstances may be, no matter how bad the situation may, may seem. I will choose to trust in the Lord. I will choose not to be influenced by the surroundings, but I choose to wait upon the Lord and fix my eyes upon Him. That's what it means by confessions. Now, now number two, why can we trust? There are three reasons. Number one, please repeat after me. Because He is... My, now get ready because it's Hebrew, right? Ready? Ezer. The word Ezer is used here. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my Ezer come from? My Ezer comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It means help. But when we talk about the word help, it actually has two nuances. Do you realize that? You know, when, when we talk about the word help, you know, there, we, we, it can mean varieties of things in English. But um, um, according to Hebrew, it actually has two nuances. Number one is when you're referring to uh, a supplement. For example, I, I don't need to have this, but I can live without it. But in order to upgrade my life, in order to improve my life, in order to make my life more full and more perfect, yeah, I will take this supplement. That's when you use the word ezer. The first time that the word ezer is used, to, used in the Bible is um, Genesis chapter 2. When God made man, Adam, and uh, he was, you know, pretty self-sufficient. He was, you know, he was a man. He was, uh, he was content with the Lord. He was satisfied with just being alone. But God said, you know what? That's not good. I'm going to improve his life. I'm going to upgrade his life. I'm going to make his life more full. I'm going to make his life more perfect. So I'm going to provide him a, what? Helper. In the, in the original language in Hebrew, the word ezer is used here. I'm going to make him an ezer that is suited for him. It's a supplement. You don't have to have it, but if you have it, it's great. You don't have to have it, but if you have it, your life's going to look more perfect. But there's a second nuance to ezer. When, when you use the word ezer, it means the second thing sometimes. It means it's a must it's a must-have. 
if you don't have it, you're going to die. When King David, he, when he sings all, in all these psalms, he, when he, use, he uses the word is there so much. He says, you are, Lord, you are my help, you are my fortress, you are my life, you are my salvation. Who should I run to when you, you, have, you have the salvation? In other words, what? If, if, if without you, I'm nothing. Without this salvation, I wouldn't get salvation anywhere else. It's not a supplement. It's a must-have. Right here, our faith is defined already. Is the Lord your supplement, or is he your absolute need? Who is he to you this morning? Is the Lord someone that, you know, I can, I can live without, but you know what? It's like almost like an insurance program. If I die, I'm going to go to heaven if I believe him. And on Sunday mornings, I come to church, and I feel good about myself, and get comforted, you know. And it's good that I come to church, and I hang out with my brothers and sisters, and go to bowling, and, you know, the food courts after church. But I don't really need to have him because, you know, I think sometimes he comes in the way of success and I need to figure out my life on my own. I need to go to college. I, need, I, just, I just need to get a good job. Sometimes you have to compromise. You have to live in the world. And the Lord actually becomes a problem in my life. So I will take advantage of him in places, of, uh, places that I want, I want him to, you know, really help me. But other times, I want him to actually stay out of, uh, out of my life. Is he a supplement to you to upgrade your life, to make your life even better? Is he just an insurance program or a hobby that you have to make your life more enriched? Or is he an absolute salvation in your life? What, does it, what, what is he to you? Is he someone that you can negotiate and compromise? Is the Lord someone that you cannot compromise? And is, is he non-negotiable? That's where your faith is defined, whether you're going to be able to endure through the last days, or maybe you should just give up. The first thing is first. So what do you do? You don't ask for everything else, but you do. one thing that I want you to do today, starting today, is this. God, define my faith. Refine my faith that I will have you as a non-compromisable God and non-negotiable object of my life. You know, I um, shared a story yesterday. Um, I experienced God when I was, in thir- when I was 13 years old, and um, God came to my life. So powerfully, I gaze upon his glory, and that changed my life. That transformed my life ever since. And I said, God, you did not compromise me on the cross. You did not negotiate my salvation. Therefore, I will not negotiate my my dedication to you, my devotion to you. And you know, those things are actually tested as you're going, as you're growing up. Especially as I was growing up, um, there are a few rules I live by. As I was going through junior high and high school, there are few rules that I actually abided by. And uh, by the time I was graduating uh, from high school, um, a school newspaper um, guys actually came to me. You know those dorky guys that you don't really hang out with? Anybody in the school newspaper? There are two people you don't hang out with, the newspaper and the math, math Olympic people. <laughs> or spelling bee. <laughs> I'm sorry if you are. I wouldn't hang out with you. Though. <laughs> I was just kidding. Uh, like, yeah. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Pythagorean theorem. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, I, I admire them. They have something that I don't have. I was so bad. I was so bad in math. People thought that I'm not Korean. <laughs> so I admire you if you have that gift. Anyways. Um, I was about to graduate from high school, but the newspaper came to me and they asked me, so can you, if you were to leave as a, as a graduating senior, if you were to leave something behind in this as your legacy, what would you leave behind? And my friends were actually pretty excited. They said, you know, I was a basketball, cap, basketball team captain, so I'm going to leave these shoes behind. And I was like, well, why would you leave dirty shoes behind you? You know, like some, somebody, my, my, my good friend, he actually said, you know, I'm a good student, so I'm going to leave my fountain pen behind. And, you know, things like that. You know how kids are. You know, my, my turn came. What are you supposed to say? I didn't have anything much to really leave behind. So I said, you know what? I'm going to leave behind how I lived through the entire junior high and high school years. I'm going to leave Danielism. So these are the seven rules I live by, and I left that behind in my high school. And I said, these are the seven rules that I live by, the golden rules. Number one, I, uh, I will not drink alcohol all the days of my life. Number two, I will not smoke nicotine all the days of my life. That, that includes drugs. And number three, 
um, I will not have premarital sex. Number four, Sunday worship is non-compromisable for me. It's a non-negotiable thing. I will worship on Sundays because that will let the entire world know that I'm a Christian. Number five, sugar-free, caffeine-free. I break this rule every single day today. You know, Starbucks, Starbucks caramel frappuccino. <laughs> you get so excited over it. Yeah, that's compromisable. <laughs> Number six, don't blame others, but just do what you have to do. I don't blame others. Just do what you have to do. And number seven, keep your hair always neat. That this hair hairstyle hasn't changed ever since. So, um, seven rules, and uh, I left that as my legacy in my high school. And I was graduating, and uh, God actually gave me one more chance for me to prove to God this is exactly how I'm going to live the rest of my life. So as I was graduating, um, and we actually took a little field trip to China, the graduation um, class field trip to China, Beijing. But you know, instead of you know, seeing your class just traveling to Beijing, looking around different places, and coming back to Japan, um, we, we, we just wanted to make it more meaningful. So we actually formed a choir, you know, choir team. So as a choir, we're actually going to go to Beijing. We're going to perform in different places, like a uh, concert at, at the Great Wall or the Tiananmen Square, or the Forbidden City, or the S Temple of Heaven, or whatnot. So we, we, we perform in different locations in China. So we did that. Um, it was, a, it was a, about an eight-day trip. So actually, we, we went to China. We performed in different locations. And, you know, every location was pretty successful. And uh, it was Saturday night. Monday through Saturday, all our performances went pretty successful. And Saturday night, um, we, we finished all the performance. And uh, we actually went to the Hard Rock Cafe Beijing. So, what, 15, no, 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 more than that, 17, 18 years, 16, 17 years ago, there were still Hard Rock Cafe Beijing. So, as a class, we went. Such a great time. Think about it. Um, it's like uh, early April. So, um, the weather is really cool and it's very dry. So, you're wearing a just light sweater and you know, all the performances are successfully finished, and you're surrounded by your classmates, and uh, you're at the Hard Rock Cafe, Beijing, a good restaurant. And, uh, you know, at the Hard Rock Cafe, there, there's a live musician that comes and plays music, right? And I don't know whether you guys know him or not, but that day when I went to uh, Hard Rock Cafe, Beijing, the, the, the musician there was Sting. Does anyone know? Maybe you don't know him. Anyways, Sting was playing live music, and as we're as we're eating at the Hard Rock Cafe, we're listening to Sting, and and um, you're just surrounded by your friends and teachers, and your grades have already come out. You you already got the acceptance letter from the Citadel. I don't have anything to worry about. All I gotta do is tomorrow Sunday I just have free time with everybody else, and Monday I go home back to Japan, and I just go to school, come back for one month not doing anything, senior, you know, and graduate and go to college. Happiest time of my life. No worries. I'm sitting there eating, right? My, my teacher named Mr. Amato, he's an interesting guy, he's an Italian guy, and he's a music teacher, and he's six foot three, very handsome. Uh, he, he wears Banana Republic and Armani only. And this guy is very snobby too. He, he, he went to NYU, and the, he, his name is Giuseppe Amato. And um, he's very mean to a lot of people. Like, for example, I used to dress pretty well. Not, I don't know what happened to me now, but it's a military school experience. But I used to dress pre pretty well. And Mr. Amato, I would walk in, and Mr. Amato used to say, oh, nice. Now I walk in, and I had a friend whose name was, um, a Korean friend, his name was Pe Pek Shik. What kind of name is a Pe Pek Shik, right? And he's from Ecuador, Ecuador. A Korean guy from Ecuador. So people don't want to call him Pepe, but we used to call him Pepe. And uh, Pepe was very Latino style. So he, he would wear clothes that's just out there in your face. He, like, for example, I would be very subtle with my clothes, like Armani or whatever, you know. But Pepe, on the other hand, say DKNY. <laughs> so he, he, Pepe would walk in, Mr. Armato would be very mean to him. It's like, Daniel, 
Good, good, good. I appreciate, I appreciate that. And he sees Pepe. He's like, Pepe, explain that. <laughs> <laughs> That's him. You know, very snobby teacher. But he was my favorite, and I, I was his favorite. You know, I was like, uh, he really liked me, and he really liked my sister. And uh, like, I was. We were both his favorite students. And uh, Mr. Amato, who was a choir teacher, he actually stood up from the table, and he's, he goes. Everybody, attention, please. Um, uh, congratulations, you guys did a very good job. Well done for the past week, the, all the performances. Very good, very good. But there's a good news. The good news is we have an encore concert tomorrow on Sunday. It's 11 o'clock and 7 p.m. We're going to have it twice in the hotel that we were staying in, Holiday in Beijing. So just enjoy your dinner, and uh, just let's get ready for the concert tomorrow. So he sat down, and my heart is already struggling with a dilemma. What am I supposed to do? I just sat there, I prayed, and I walked up to the teacher, Mr. Amato, and he's eating, he's happy. He's like, yeah. And I asked him, tomorrow's Sunday, I gotta go to church. And he thought I was joking. He, he thought I was joking. He's like, ha, 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 yeah. It's China, there's no church, it's worship in your room. And I was like, Mr. Amato, I gotta go to church. He's like, no, we're, we're, we have a concert. Mr. Amato, please, no, we have a concert. He's like, Mr. Amato, please, I gotta go to church. And Mr. Amato actually yelled at me. He's like, no! You know, Sting, he was playing. He had to stop his music. I'm probably the only person in his, in, in his music history actually stopped his music. And Sting was just staring at us, like, what's going on here? And Mr. Amato was yelling at me, you're not gonna go to church. I said, please, I gotta go. No, please, no, please. And it's pretty, pretty bad. Everybody's looking at us. My friends, you know, took my arms and they dragged me out. <laughs> Outside the restaurant, Mr. Amato is already fuming. He's sitting down. I'm outside the restaurant, and uh, all my friends start to yell at me. They said, because of people like you, I'm not going to go to church. You Christians, you never compromise. They, they were like pouring things out to me. They were saying, because of you, I'm not going to go to church. Because of you, like I don't like God. You know, because of people like you, there are words by Christians and stuff like that. They bring out all these things. What do kids know? You know, they bring out all these things from history. I'm just getting attacked. And because my sister was one of my, uh, the, my, my teacher's one of my uh, one of his favorite students, as Mr. Amato was sitting down, my sister actually, as a ninth grader, she actually joined the trip too as his secretary. So Mr. Amato sitting there and he's fuming. My sister, who's one of his favorites, and she actually walked up to him, said, Mr. Amato. And Mr. Amato is like, what? And my sister actually said, you know how much my brother likes you. My, Mr. Amato is like, so what? My sister goes, but you know, as much as he loves you, there's one thing that he's not going to compromise, but to worship on Sunday. And Mr. Amato goes, what? And he goes, she, she, my, my sister told Mr. Amato, no matter how much you're set on the concert tomorrow, my brother will not compromise his worship. About 30 minutes later, as I was still getting verbally attacked my, by, by my friends, Mr. Amato came out of the restaurant and he saw me and that day he told me something, probably the best he could, he could, best, best he could do. He came up to me and this is what he said, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> he left. So that night, I actually did whatever I wanted to do. So I went to every single room, my friend's room, knock, knock. Um, you know, I called my friends out, let's go to church, meet me in the lobby at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. So we actually went to, I went to the lobby next morning thinking, you know what? Even if it's just by myself and my sister, I'm, gonna go to, I'm still going to go to church. And I went to the lobby, guess what? There's about 30 people waiting so all of us got into a taxi cab, 10 taxis. So we don't know, we don't know Chinese. I didn't know Chinese, so I actually had to ask the hotel reception, like, tell us the government sanctioned church where we want to go worship our God. And the hotel reception actually told us the location of the church, and they actually wrote it for us. Uh, and then once you get into church, once you get into the cab, you don't want to speak in English, nor Korean, or Japanese. You don't want to do that because, you know, you don't want the, you know, those taxi drivers to think you're a foreigner and take you somewhere else. So I told them, I told all my friends, just say one word, just a location, the destination, that's it. Don't say a single word, act like you're a local. Not loco, but local. <laughs> so I got into the cab. This is the one thing you say, you got into the cab, 
taxi driver is like, Chinar, where are you going? And I said, Jinlun Fan Tian. And then the taxi driver goes, Hao, <laughs> start driving. So we went to church around 3 p.m. We came back. Of course, 30 of us were gone. Mr. Amato, his concert was canceled. He is obviously angry. That evening, we actually had a successful concert. Monday, we went back home. For the remaining one month of the school, senior year, Mr. Amato didn't speak a word to me. He didn't see my face. I, whenever I saw him lecturing in class, it was as if he wanted to kill me. And I graduated. I got my diploma. I was coming out of my school. And I was going to the parking lot. And I still remember Mr. Amato actually came up to me from there. He was made, trying to make eye contact with me. I'm trying to avoid his eye contact. It's scary. It's like laser coming out of his eyes. And Mr. Amato actually came towards me. On the very, very last day of the school, he actually stretched out his hand. So I held his hand. As soon as I was holding his hand, he pulled me towards himself. He actually pointed his finger at me. This is what he said. He said, I wanted to kill you that day. I was like, OK. And this is what he said. He said, but if you had compromised that day, I wouldn't have respected you as much as I do today. Do you hear that? He said, if you had compromised on that day, I wouldn't have respected you as much as today. And since then, until today, every event or anything, any event um, organized on Sundays are completely canceled forever in my high school. Even till, even till now, there's no event held on Sundays. What, who are you going to compromise? Are you going to compromise God? Or are you going to compromise your friends? Are you going to compromise God? Or are you going to compromise your success? Are you here to please God? Or are you here to please others? If you're trying to please others, you're no longer the servant of God. Is God your supplement to upgrade your life? Or is he the absolute salvation of your life that you cannot compromise no matter what? The, by the time you decide on that, that really determines how much you can handle the last days. Number two, why, why, do you, why, can, you, why can you trust God? Number, number one, he was, he was my ezer. Number two, please repeat after me. Uh, he... Okay, one more time. He, he is, is my, my ready ezer itself. This very interesting thing is used here. A word is used here. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my ezer come from? My ezer comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The word, the proposition, the preposition that's used here is from. You know what? Prep, prep, you know prepositions, right? Gram, grammar class. From, to, in, out, under, over, right? Preposition. It shows um, the location. Uh, it's, a, it's a locative. It shows the location of um, the op where, where the where the um, where the subject is. But it says, "Where is my ezer from?" It says, "My ezer comes from." The preposition is from, as if God is saying, "You want help? Okay, here's the help." But it's a mistranslation. If you look at the real, if you look at the original original language, Hebrew word, the expression used here is um, Hebrew word nin, which is uh, which is not from, but probably the more accurate translation is is this. Let me translate, re retranslate it. I lift up my eyes. I look at the hills. Hills. Where is my help? My help comes not from the Lord, but he says, my help comes with the Lord. Who comes, who created the heaven and earth. In other words, the help that we're looking for is not something that God gives you. Here's the help. Okay, now get the, get the help and leave me alone. It's never like that. God says, you know what? I am the help that you're looking for. When I'm in your life, you have everything. When I'm in your life, you know, there is nothing more that you can, you can ask for. That's the help that you've been looking for, you know? He is the song that you ultimately want to sing. He is the dance that you ultimately want to dance. God is the one that you're looking for. He's the ultimate con contentment. He's the ultimate satisfaction. He is the ultimate 
living water that, 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 can, that can satisfy you. You know, um, I was uh, actually, um, I don't know why I prayed like this when I was um, in the U.S. for about 10 years. Maybe starting with my um, fourth year, as soon as I graduated from college, I, for six years while I was in Chicago, there's one prayer that I constantly prayed. You know what that prayer is? God, I want to be content with you alone. That's the only prayer that I pray. I don't know why. That, I've been praying for that for six years. What do I know? I just prayed and prayed for that. Every time I sit down, this is, this, that's, that's the only thing I pray. God, I want to be content with you alone. I don't want, I don't want to be influenced by anything else. I don't want, I'm not looking for anybody, anybody else's confirmation and affirmation. I'm just going to be content with you alone. I just want to be content with you. I, want, I just want to be satisfied in you. you know, your loving kindness is better than my life. When I sleep and wake up in the morning, I open my eyes. I want to be satisfied with your face. That's the only thing I've been prayed. I, I've prayed for six years. But one day, I left the U.S. And... Uh, you know, I had totally forgotten about that prayer, the fact that I prayed. Sitting, on, sitting in the tra train, looking outside, all the hills and mountains and desert and everything, you're looking outside, and I thought to myself, man, this is lonely. Being a missionary is not a, you know, I'm always surrounded by people, but being, in a, mis being a missionary, our senior pastor knows it very well, that being out there as a missionary in Africa. You know, being, being a missionary is a lonely life, because not so many times you're not surrounded by anyone so many times you just have to stay by yourself and walk with God so I'm just sitting there in the train I'm thinking man this is very very lonely I'm out of nowhere all alone I'm going up to the mountain of Tibet I'm just sitting there I'm thinking God you know, why don't you bring me a wife God, why, why did you make me so alone? Why don't I even have a family? Why am I so lonely? And this, you know what? Really, something strange happened. I remembered what I prayed for for six years. And God says, this is the answer to your prayer. And I said, what? And I thought, my goodness, I've been praying for over six years. I want to be satisfied with you alone. And God, that was the answer. God was saying, you know what? Now, are you satisfied with me alone? I'm giving you an opportunity to learn how to be content with the Lord alone. What do you seek in your life? Do you want to achieve something through the Lord? Or do you want the Lord to just say, you know what, this is a gift, this is the answer to your prayer, but in, the, in this gift, you are not going to be able, able to enjoy me, but do you still want this prayer to be answered? Or are you going to say, amen, hallelujah, just give me the, give, 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 me the, give it to me. This is exactly the prayer that Moses offered to God. You know, when God, when God led the Israelites out of Egypt into the, into the wilderness, and Moses actually went up to the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he was encountering God, receiving the covenants, right? And while he was doing that, you know, that's a very, very dramatic moment. Think about it. Out in the wilderness, God brought his brides out into the wilderness, and God, as if he was kneeling down and stooping down before the lady, God was telling Moses, telling all the people, God was pretty much proposing to them, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. In other words, will you marry me? That's what he was doing. But he, while he was doing that, what, what did the people do? They made the golden calf and they started worshiping that, right? God was angered by that. So what did he say? If you look at Exodus chapter 33, this is what happens. God comes to Moses and he says, you know what? I'm a faithful God. I'm a faithful God. It looks like the ideal relationship that I've once wanted, it looks like it's not going to work out. Because I will always long for you, but you will always stray away from me. But I'm a faithful God, so I will keep my promise. So I will let you in to the land of milk and honey, but I will not go with you. You just go and go into the promised land, but I, I'm not going to go with you. What will you say? Today, if God comes to you and say, I will answer all the prayer topics that you've ever asked for. You want something? I will give it to you. If, you. if you want a great life, I'll give it to you. If you want to answer the prayer, I'll give it to you. But in that lifestyle, I can't be there with you. But I, because I'm a faithful God, because I'm a good God, I want to give you everything that you want, but I can't be, with, I can't be there with you. What would you say? Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Is that, is that what you're going to say? Or will you say what Moses said? What did Moses say on that day? He said, unless you're going to go up 
with us into the promised land, don't even send us. I'd rather die in the wilderness with you. And what did Moses say after that? God, show us your glory. In other words, I want to be mesmerized by you. I want to be captured by your glory. I want to hide in your glory. What do you want? Do you want the Lord? Or do you want the blessings that come through the Lord? The Lord is my, is a self. Number three. Please repeat after me. The Lord is my almighty Ezer. What does it say? My Ezer comes from the Lord, comes with the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Do you believe that? I remember uh, there's, a, there's a church called Onduri Church in Korea. And one of, uh, I remember uh, pa- Pastor Ha Yong-jo, the senior pastor there, once preached before he passed away. He actually said, you know, if you believe Genesis chapter 1-1, if you believe that, the entire Bible is valid for you. But if you don't believe Genesis 1-1, with everything you've got, you're willing to rest your entire life on the truth that's declared in Genesis 1-1. Unless you do that, there's no reason for you to proceed to Genesis 1-2. You know why? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, you're going to be able to believe that Jesus Christ came through virgin birth. If you believe that, you know Jesus Christ, it's not even a problem for him to make the dead, dead person come alive. If you believe that Jesus Christ, that God has created the heavens and the earth, you know one day he's going to come in, he's going to, he's going to be able to create the new heaven and the new earth, new Jerusalem. He's going to be reigning all the earth. But if you really don't believe that, if, you don't, if you're not willing to rest your entire life on this one truth, what do you believe? What, what's the point of doing a Christian life? I'm going to challenge you today. Our help is the very present help when we're in time of trouble. And he is the help itself. He's my absolute salvation, but he's the almighty help. He can change the nothingness into something. He can change death into life. What more do you want in your life? Lastly, number three. Time has just flown by. It's already an hour and a half. So let me just finish it up, okay? Or do you want the conclusion, or do you want me to just wrap it up? Wrap it up? Okay. See? You got to stone the person who says wrap it up. <laughs> That's what I would do if I were <laughs> to so, conclusion. Number three. Uh, so what do you help? What, what is the content of the? How is the Lord going to help? How, how's the Lord going to help? So let's look at verses three through eight. Three through eight. Let's read this together. Verse three through eight. Ready? Go. Amen. What's one word that's keep on being used here? Keep. You see this um, train of thought in this author's mind? I lift up my eyes. I look at the hills. Where does my absolute salvation come from? My absolute salvation come with the Lord who created the entire universe. And the Lord will help me in this way. And he elaborates it from verse 3 to verse 8. He will keep you. The word is keep. Hebrew word is shamar. And you see that in verse 3? He will not let your foot be removed. He who keeps you, shamar, who will not slumber. Shamar you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps shamar, Israel, will neither slumber nor sleep. Verse 5, the Lord is your shamar, keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Verse 6, the sun will not strike you by day, nor by nor moon by night. The Lord will shamar, keep you from all evil. He will shamar your life. The Lord will shamar, keep you going out and you coming in from this time forth and forever. The word is shamar. The Lord's going to help us. How? He's going to keep you. 
But your, your question is, what does it mean by keeping us? You know, don't keep us here, I want to go to lunch. <laughs> what do you mean by keeping? The word shamar actually means something else. The word, out of that word shamar, the Hebrew word um, shepherd came. You know what that means? To keep the, the flock, to keep the people of God, it means the shepherd is willing to lay down his life so that the flock that he guided out, going from one pastor, one pastor to another, he's going to make sure that every single sheep will be returning to home safely, without, without being lost. You know, if you look at um, God's heart, it's pretty interesting. Why do you think that there's a story of um, 10 coins, but th this woman lost one coin? And right next to it, there's a story of the father. Who, uh, uh, right next to it, there's a story of um, 100 sheep, but one lost sheep. And in the end, Jesus talks about two sons, and but one lost son. What do you think that the story is talked about? I think one of the one of the reasons why God shared that in, in that in that fashion is because of this. He, first, he talked about one hundred sheep but one lost sheep, which means one percent is not even enough. I need ninety nine percent is not enough for God. He says he, he says I need to have one hundred percent. Ninety percent is not enough. Having nine coins but one lost coin is not enough. I'm not going to be satisfied with one. I'm going to be satisfied with 100% of the coins. Having two sons, one missing, and having the other is not enough. He said, I need to have two sons back. The word keeping means God's going to make sure that every single one of us, by God's effort, will be, in, will be able to enter the promised land, the, the new Jerusalem, the embrace of God, um, no matter how the situations may seem at this moment, no matter whether we are confident about our faith, that we're gonna, I'm going to be able to keep my faith or not, whether you believe that or not, God will be the one who's going to uh, keep your faith. He's going to make sure that you keep your faith until that day comes, and he's going to make sure that you enter the kingdom of God. How do you know that? How do you know that? How, yeah, well, that sounds like a pretty good promise, but how do I know it's, it's for real? But do you remember 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came and he says, I, you know, I am the good shepherd. You know, the good shepherd actually lays down his life and makes sure that every single sheep will be protected. And Jesus actually showed us that when he was crucified on the cross. You know what the most painful thing about, uh, about the cross is? You know, you know do, have you ever really think about and meditate on the cross? If I, if I do, one thing really broke my heart. You know what that is? Probably the most painful thing about the cross, whole experience of the cross, is the psychological pain. You, have, has anyone seen the movie Saw? Don't watch that kind of movie. It's pretty bad. But one thing is, um, well, the Saw is, I think it's a very psychological movie. It's a, like, for example, there's a key to escape in your like, friend who's captured in this, confined in the same room with you, uh, the key to unlock this thing is in, the, in this person's body. So in order to get the key, you have to kill this person, or there's a little saw coming your way, or you, get, you, you die. It's very psychological. Probably the most painful thing in that kind of situation is you know how to get out. But it's a, it's, it's a psychological dilemma whether you should kill the other person and you escape, or you die. Every single mo moment, every single second that Saul actually comes closer and closer to you, you're constantly making that decision, I'm going to choose to die, I'm going to choose to die, I'm going to choose to die, I'm not going to sacrifice my friend. You know what, you know what the most, most painful thing about the cross is? It's a psychological aspect, I think. You know why? Because Jesus Christ could have come down any moment he wanted. Jesus Christ could have come down from the cross bringing, mobilizing the entire heavenly host, and he could have struck the entire Israelites and Romans. But for Jesus, probably the most painful thing was this. He has a key to escape, but he says, every time the pain went through his entire body, every time he felt paralyzed because of the pain, he was making a conscious choice. Every single thing that he was making a conscious choice, I'm going to complete, I'm going to complete, I'm going to complete. I'm going to complete. 
every time that shock went through his body, went throughout his entire body, he, he had to make a conscious choice. I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose you. And when he was about to draw his last breath, he says, it's finished. That's the Jesus that you have. How much less are you going to give it to him?